Hi, Jan. Welcome back to uh, Bell Labs. Uh, what's it like to be back here? Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I've, I think last time I was in this building was a few years ago because one of my students was working here and I came give a talk. But, but the time before that must have been 15 years ago. And, and what's your fondest memory of Bell Labs as an environment? Uh... Oh, there's so many, so, so many wonderful memories of, uh, of, of Bell Labs. I was, uh, I guess, the day of my interview, I was um, incredibly impressed by everything I saw. I saw, for the first time, I visited an institution where every experiment, every lab that I was shown, I'd read about it in you know, some sort of, uh, you know, like Scientific American or something like that, right? And so this was, this was incredibly impressive. And, and it spanned the spectrum. I was really impressed by how broad a lot of my, uh, my colleagues were. I was essentially the first, I don't define myself as a computer scientist really, but uh, so I'm not a computer scientist, I'm not an analytical engineer, I'm certainly not a physicist, I'm not a neuroscientist. Uh, a little bit, a little bit of. You play one in the movies. I play, right, exactly. <laughs> um, but I was the, the sort of first kind of you know computer scientist type uh, in a in a lab that was entirely composed of physicists, and I love that. Uh, it's wonderful for me. Um, uh, solid state phys physicists, uh, condensed matter physicists, um, and uh, I think the the kind of questions we authorize ourselves to think about were so broad. So it wasn't just machine learning, neural nets, or things like this. It wasn't just uh, mathematics, or hardware, or algorithms, or you know, how you fabricate neural nets in a piece of silicon. Uh, it was also, um, you know, what, is, what does intelligence mean? Uh, it was neuroscience, theoretical neuroscience. It was uh, the foundation of physics. It turns out um, my, my close colleague, John Denker, was uh, mm -hmm. Uh, very fond of those questions, and we participated in a number of conferences, published a few papers on this. So, I have you know one paper in physical review letter. That's my oh, that, credential. That, that, as yeah, a physicist. I have one too. But uh, <laughs> so I was a chemist, um, but they thought I was smarter than I was because they didn't understand chemistry. So, <laughs> so a combination of those things, and then I worked with theoreticians. I was also in the physics area, but mm -hmm. it was that cross fertilization where every discipline could bring something to the table and the ideas just got better and better. And I right. think that was, that's it. And I think it's still what Bell Labs goes after today. So there's a fond memory I have, which is that uh, at, in Homedale, there was a weekly uh, lunch table for yeah. people who wanted to speak French, uh, the French table. And there's this old lady that came every week to the French table called Betty Woods. And Betty Woods was the first woman MTS at Bell Labs, member of technical staff at Bell Labs. The first women research scientists at Bell Labs. She joined Bell Labs in the late 30s. Uh, she had done a PhD in physics. And when she asked what area of physics uh, she, should, she should work in, her advisor told her, well, you know, you should work on crystallography because you won't have competitions for men because it's really kind of a <laughs> marginal yeah, area. Yeah. So she, was, uh, she became a crystallographer. And then in the 30s, a lot of people at Bell Labs became very interested in particular types of crystals of for semiconductors, yeah. of course. And so she taught, um, she taught crystallography to uh, to all the men, the the transistor yeah. inventors, oh, essentially. That's fun. Uh, and she was this uh, incredibly smart lady. With the lunch table has always been actually uh, one of our uh, things we still talk about because it was this place where ideas got shared because you all went to lunch at roughly the same time. Right. It was a packed area, so you would by accident tile across to another group. Right. And because the conversations were on both sides, and that right. created a lot of the foundational innovation. I think uh, a lot of them were born on napkins. Yes. Were born on napkins and with bad food. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the thing we struggle with, actually, and I think we can talk about now we're diverse and remote. Diversity is great from being having access to different talent pools, but that human interaction of an accidental serendipitous interaction yes. is something that is quite hard to to recreate. Do you That's think true. now if we talk AI? that there's something about being physically next to a, another human being that is very hard to describe or maybe even impossible to describe. I think that's the case. I mean, certainly recreating the ser serendipitous interactions for people who are in remote location is going to be a very uh, challenging problem. Uh, I mean, Facebook is actually working on connecting people. That's really, it's not only its main business, it's only business, really. Uh, and so one of the approaches to this is, is using uh, virtual reality, which yeah. basically can transport you uh, in a place where other people can be transported as well, and you have kind of more personal interactions with those people. 
I, I, actually, uh, that's a good point you raise. I actually do believe, and I, I think Facebook was smart to buy Oculus at the time. It, people thought maybe it was a bit of a reach, but you can see that uh, my daughter was a big Facebook user, uh, that, but she looks at a screen, and on the other side of the screen is her friend. Right? But what they should do is they should be in a space together yep. where they're interacting with a world, right. uh, and I think you can imagine that being how we interact. One of the interesting things in that is this idea of chain of persuasion, mm -hmm. where unless you have the physical stimuli, that go along with the virtual stimuli, you're not quite convinced that you're really in a space. That's right. So that gets to this idea of multi-sensory AI. How much do you think there is that isn't just about seeing, but is about those other senses that will convince people they're really having that experience, even though they sort of know they aren't, but they, they're so convinced that they, they make those leaps that we like to make and we really feel like we're talking like this. Right, so there is this concept in, uh, in virtual reality called, uh, called presence, which is the, the feeling that you are really there. Yeah. Um, and so you're kind of you know, on a ledge and you're just not going to take that step that yeah. <laughs> makes you going to fall over. Um, so that notion of presence, I think, might, to some extent, replace some of this uh, It does. What I've, what I've heard is that you need some physical triggers. So the example is, True. even if you just have a one-inch ledge, you need to feel that pressure on the back of your uh, bottom of your foot before you're convinced yes. it's a ledge. Yes. So we've got this multi-sensory input function right. ourselves that you need to trigger some of that as well as seeing the ledge. Is that something you, you think is... If so, it's quite hard to understand how a machine would, would feel that, but maybe it could be emulated. Well, it's haptic feedback, right? I mean, yes. it's, it's, not, it's not something that is... It's not a domain that's currently very connected with AI, really. Uh, I guess AI would be if we come up with virtual digital assistants with whom we'd like to have a kind of more direct, uh, uh, complete relationship than just kind of talking to it, your, your phone. It has to be more uh, physical. Then, then we'll have to have uh, sort of embodied, you know, virtually embodied uh, intelligent, uh, intelligent agents. I mean, there's also robots, of course, but, of course, but that's kind of that. different. Um, so let's get on to your, closer to your actual area. So I loved a couple of things you, uh, you've said. One is uh, the essence of intelligence is the ability to predict. You want to talk about that? I think it's fascinating. I would never have reduced it to that one dimension, but it's a very powerful reduction. So uh, say a little bit more about why you think that's the case. Right. So if you, if you think really, uh, I mean, if you had to reduce really intelligence to kind of a, a single concept, it would be the ability to predict, not just predict what's going to happen in the world, uh, because the world is being the world, but what's going to happen in the world as a consequence of your actions. Mm -hmm because that ability allows you to plan, to plan ahead. And planning, long-term planning is really uh, what requires intelligence. It requires to deal with the uncertainty of the prediction. Uh, it requires to figure out what sequence of actions will make the world or a particular part of the world reach a, uh, reach a, a particular goal. And so um, the ability to form models of the world is an essential piece of intelligence, and there is some evidence that a, a big chunk of our brain is devoted to building models of the world. And that model has to be fluid and yes. evolving, otherwise essentially you would, you would have a childlike intelligence and that wouldn't have evolved into a more sophisticated intelligence that allows you to predict your right. current world. So that's well, you also have to somehow form those models very quickly. You're yeah. facing a new situation, and you sort of have to kind of simulate what, you know, what the situation would lead to in your head before you can act on it. You have to do things that... Uh, technically would be called causal inference. So for example, mm -hmm. you have a, uh, a system that evolves in a particular way and you have to figure out where you can act to modify the behavior of that system. And so you have to know the causal relationship between the, the various things that you observe um, to be able to uh, you know, have an effect that you, that you desire. It's a very complex problem, I see from the theoretical point of view as well. So in the current way that people think about intelligence, they, they always now throw an EQ the emotional mm -hmm. quotient to go with the IQ. Uh, where do you see emotion uh, fitting in that model? Is that an important part of the prediction uh, for certain predictions? Obviously, if they're more scientific predictions, probably there's not so much emotion. In it. But if it's a interacting with the world prediction, is, is emotion part of that? Well, so there is a, a part of your internal model of the world that predicts the physical world. There is a part that predicts other people's behavior, which is, of course, very important in human society. Uh, and that's where things like um, you know, learning from others, imitation, empathy mm. uh, comes from, because you have a, an accurate model of the person you talk to. Uh, the best way to communicate with someone is to know what state of mind that person is in, what that person knows or doesn't know. And to some extent mimic their model, or at least uh, right, or respond, respond to, to 
you know, kind of empty slots in their minds if you want to answer questions that they might be uh, asking or to know what they already know so that you don't repeat it, you don't bore them. Um, it's pretty useful if you're a professor. <laughs> and, and so this kind of the ability to kind of build models of other people is, is essential. And this is, some, this is something, an ability that our machines will have to have if we want them to hold useful dialogues with us yeah. without annoying us. Uh, then there is a second part, which is um, in the component of an intelligent system, there is the, this model of the world that gives us the ability to predict. There is what I would call an actor. It's actually kind of a standard nomenclature in, in machine learning, which is a, a module that figures out what sequence of actions mm. will reach a, a particular goal. And then there is um, a, a kind of a, it's called a critic. It's a module that predicts whether a result, uh, the result of a sequence of action will lead to a good outcome or a bad outcome. Basically, it measures or it measures or, you know, how happy you, ha you are. Yeah, really. you call this your objective function. Uh, okay, so the objective function is the thing that instantly tells you if you're happy or not. The critic is the thing that predicts the uh, future value of that objective function, uh, right? Uh, so for example, the objective function, you know, if I punch you in your face, which I'm not going to do. Well, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, you're going to feel pain immediately. So there's a term, there's some objective function in your brain that, that is going to be very unhappy about this. Yes. Uh, and it's going to make your entire brain unhappy about it, very unhappy about me. Um, but but if, I, if I mimic the action and I stop it beforehand, there's a piece of your brain that's predicting what's going to happen. And there's another piece of your brain that predicts what the, how unhappy you're going to be about this. Exactly. Right? And that's going to cause you to react. It cause me to react, to move away. Exactly. Or if I'm a masochist, uh, then move into the punch or something. Yeah, something like, like that, right? <laughs> and so that's going to create an emotion, yeah. which could be a combination of uh, uh, you know, fear, yeah. uh, you know, possibly, or um, uh, the word escapes me, but you know, the, all the kinds of emotions you can get when you feel threatened. Yes. Right? The fight or flight and, and all the that. The fight or flight, yeah, you know, exactly. your adrenaline, adrenaline is going to yeah. go up yeah. and that's going to cause your brain to function differently. So those emotions, uh, in my opinion, at least many emotions, not all of them, but some, some of them are anticipation of, of outcomes. I think uh, it's a very clever way to describe it. So you've got your intelligence is your prediction function, which includes prediction of people and physics of the world. Right. And then you've got uh, emotions, to some extent, uh, are this function that says, you need that physiological reaction that says, ah, that's telling me I'm going to feel a physical pain or an intellectual pain uh, under certain outcomes. Or, or a pleasure. Or, or a pleasure or an affinity pain. So I you know. therefore should perform that action. That's or right. modify the action. That's right. And, and emotions are sort of uh, an early read on the outcome. An early read, a prediction of yeah. the outcome, uh, of the, the quality of the outcome, if you want. So I, I, I do love the fact that this Machine way of describing humans, of course, has a lot of logic to it. Uh, we talked about distorted objective, uh, objective functions as well. There are certain people who perhaps have distorted objection functions, or objective functions, which say they can't actually decide what are good and bad outcomes uh, according to a normal morality. And, and right. I, I think that's an interesting thing as well. So human morality is, is uh, probably the cause of, or the result of evolution building into us some elementary uh, behaviors, but also elementary terms in this objective function yes. that we're optimizing. And in our, in our daily lives, we're not necessarily optimizing this objective function all the time, but we have learned to uh, uh, compute, if you want, substitute objective functions. So for example, we fi you know, a lot of us have figured out that you, know, you need a job, <laughs> uh, you need to earn some money. Yeah. Uh, we have different you know, coefficients on that term you know, for different people who are motivated by money or not. Uh, when we're little, we are kind of um, you know, pushed into thinking that going to school is good for us, right? which it is in the long run. But in the short run, it's not. So uh, you know, our objective function is being shaped by our environment. Uh, and we create uh, uh, kind of substitute objective functions to kind of, um, that, that are easy to optimize in our daily lives. Yeah. And cultures, of course, have different objective functions as well. And, and so then the distortions of that can cause aberrant behaviors as well, which is what's interesting. Right. And even you can explain psychological disorders as giving uh, just distorted objective functions. You Possibly. Know. I mean, this Possibly. is going on a limb. You know, I'm really not a psychologist, but... We're not, but the, we're, we're <laughs> going to play one in this little movie. Okay. But it's, it's very interesting <laughs> because I think in the end, uh, what your work and your talk shows is the way to understand machines and the way to understand humans are not dissimilar. 
And the question is how close do they become and that one can become the other, and I think that's the grand question. Well, I think it's one of the reasons I'm so interested in, uh, in artificial intelligence, which is ultimately is going to help us understand ourselves. Yeah, that is fascinating, isn't it? That we'll reduce it down either way a thing that can't be computed, but we'll get a closer, a, small, a better definition of what is that part you can't. Right. Uh, or we'll be able to decompose ourselves and understand our problem is it's just an objective function, which maybe makes us able to deal with it a little bit better, right? Because it's now doesn't become quite so uh, personal in some right. ways. It, it, you can just isolate the different problems and maybe even go after them biologically uh, because you can now identify where that problem is. Right. Because it's decomposed elegantly. I mean, I think it's a. Uh it's a very sort of Bell Labs-y sort of Bell engineering Labs approach <laughs> to things, right? Richard Feynman, I think, said uh, you don't really understand how something works until you build it yourself. And I think, that's and I think it's, it might be true of intelligence as well. Um, you know, for example, the analogy that I use very often is uh, uh, aerodynamics developed as a consequence of building airplanes, thermodynamics developed as a consequence of building steam engines. Uh, and so the practice comes first, you build an artifact, and then you build a theory to try to understand how it works. Yes, yeah, so I guess it's related to the uh, uh, necessity being the mother of invention. So right. there has to be a thing, you invent the thing, then you try and understand the behavior of the thing you've invented. There's it's also the value of uh, empirical tinkering and engineering. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then the science that goes behind explaining why things work in kind of a more general form than, than just the tinkering. She gets back to the idea we're actually maybe super skilled at using tinkering as a substitute for incomplete knowledge uh, by exploring the yeah, space. Yeah, that's right. You explore and, the space. And, and then once you've limited that, and there's a very fast exploration you can do, you then work on the theory, which can take decades sometimes to come uh, and actually support what's been found, sometimes right. even more. Well, I think the human mind is... Uh, conditioned to go from the, the specific to the general. Right? We're very good at general, making generalizations, sort of abstracting uh, principles out of Wild a number of examples, yeah, right? I mean, exactly. this is what machine learning is about also, yeah. right? You give the machine a bunch of examples and it kind of abstracts the concept of what is a car, what is an airplane, et cetera. So uh, I think, you know, tinkering and building an artifact and then sort of hmm. figuring out in what condition it works helps you abstract the concept of why it works and the theory behind it. So I think that's what happened during the, the history of steam engine and thermodynamics, the history of aviation and aerodynamics, uh, and perhaps today with the history of uh, artificial intelligence and the understanding of the principles behind intelligence. I'm, I'm looking for the equivalent of aerodynamics for intelligence, basically. Well, I think maybe politically we have it. <laughs> so uh, we'll wrap up there. And uh, thanks very much, Anne. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so thanks much. Thank you so much.